Yo, what is up, headhunters and executive recruiters? This is your boy, DSP, David Stefan Patterson. And today, I'm going to share with you the 20 words that kill your sales as a recruiter. Now, before I do so, I do want to bring one thing up. So, in one of my uh, prior videos, I uh, screenshotted a still and posted that in our Facebook group, the Headhunter and Executive Recruiter Community, or hashtag the Herc. And I asked them to caption the uh, photo. In fact, I'm going to show it right now. All right. So, uh, and I got a lot of great captions from that, and I'm going to pick the top three and float them back in the group. We're going to vote on the top one, and the winner of that will get a little prize from me, most likely a Headhunter t-shirt. So with that said, though, uh, I do want to make one more comment. One of the comments in there was about my rock salt lamp right here. Now, um, uh, just to clarify, because I'm not a very woo-woo person, I'm very scientific. And so people see that salt rock lamp and say, David, I thought you were no bullshit kind of guy. I am. I don't believe in all the crazy gobbledygook about salt lamps. But with that said, I just think they look pretty cool. So that is why I have a salt rock lamp on my desk. For those of you folks who know me as a no BS kind of guy, don't worry, I still am. And with that said, let's get to the topic at hand, shall we? So, uh, this topic is the top 20 words and phrases that you should never, ever use. Now, uh, what is our goal whenever we communicate with a candidate or a client, or a prospective client, rather, and a prospective candidate? Our goal is a move is not to close the deal. Our move is our goal is to move them in an orderly fashion to a logical conclusion. And the logical conclusion is for the client to sign an agreement with you, preferably at a higher level, not contingency if possible, and to get them to hire somebody from you. And of course, on the candidate side, to get a candidate who likely was not on the market, not initially interested in your client, but who is a top performing person or professional in their field to get them interested and eventually take a job with your client. But there's a series of steps along the way. For the candidate, the first initial reach out, maybe email or ad or in-mail or cold call or whatever it is, getting them into just a, an initial five minute conversation. Just a five minute conversation and we could determine, are there some pains? Because people don't move careers unless they're in some sort of pain, even if they're happy at their job. So we are looking for some of those problems and pains that they may be experiencing that our client can then solve with their new opportunity. Or maybe we're looking for some unrealized visions that they're not uh, able to realize with their current role that our client can help them realize, right? That's what we're looking for, at least the best of us. For a lot of recruiters, we just say, are you interested? No, okay, we go on to the next. But the skill for practitioners, that's what we do. Now, next step is to get the resume and to get into a longer conversation, develop more interest, have that candidate talk to their spouse, and make sure it's the right move for their family, all the way down the line through the interview prep and the debrief and the, the pre-closing call and all these things all the way down to that candidate uh, accepting a job, starting with their client and, and working there happily ever after. Or for the prospective client, same deal. Initial reach out. Or maybe they see an ad, or they see your content, they reach out to you, whatever it is, but get, get into just a, a quick little conversation to move to the next step, which might be a needs analysis or it might be for trying to demonstrate your value, maybe to strategy call. Let's take a look at your broker recruitment process or any, any sort of gaps, and I can help you solve those because I'm an expert in the industry and I wanna demonstrate that. And for you young recruiters who are, who are wet behind the ears and don't have a lot of authority in the market, that is a great way to build your authority really fast, is, is to get good at recruitment and get good at the recruitment process and help uh, and, and give that knowledge away as much as possible, okay? So, and then from there, 
move into an actual, get into a signed agreement, get in a check from them to start on a search and then to interview your candidates and all the way down the line to their interview prep and their interview debrief. And I hope you're prepping your clients and debriefing your clients, by the way. If you're not, you should be, but preps, debriefs, all the way down the line to them hiring a top performing candidate and living happily ever after because of you. So it's a whole process. Now I'm gonna share with you some 20 words and phrases that will kill your success at every step. They'll either disengage your prospect or they'll, or it'll break trust or create negative feelings or something like that. So I wanna share these with you right now. In no particular order, here we go. Number one, to be honest with you, or to be frank, or to be candid, or seriously, or trust me, I think you get my point. That sends a subliminal message to your prospect that you are not to be trusted. Now, what you're saying isn't really factually correct, but now I'm serious. But now, oh, I'm honest now. Let me be frank. I was Carl before. All right, that's a stupid joke. I was being frank before, but now I am frank. Now I'm really going to be honest with you. Okay, that's just, it's a filler phrase you don't need it there's no need for it and it's just just don't you just drop it completely get out of it get rid of it number two sorry to bother you if you were sorry to bother me then why are you bothering me when i hear this from prospects that call me oh i just want to like yeah you're probably really bad at sales aren't you you're not making a lot of money when you're saying that when you have something that is of huge value, you don't say sorry. If you have a $10,000 check in your back pocket and your mission is to go to the mall and hand it to a, to a, a lucky guy or a lucky gal and they're about to be $10,000 richer, are you going to walk up and say, I'm sorry to bother you? No, you're not. You see, if, if you're going to be a, a master salesman or a master saleswoman, and believe me, in our business, we have to be, even if you just work on the candidate side, then we can't be here while we put them up on a pedestal here. Sir, I'm sorry to bother, sir, I'm sorry. Could you please forgive, please give me a few minutes of your, I'm so sorry to bother you. No, don't do that, okay? Don't do that. So never ever say sorry to bother you, okay? Drop that out of the equation completely. It shows that you don't believe in your service. It shows that your service is no better than anybody else's, so just drop it. Next, number three, I'd like to, or I'd love to connect. I'd like to connect. I'd love to connect with you. Well, I don't give a shit what you love to do. I'm busy. I'm the VP of operations for a manufacturing plant in Carmel, Indiana, and I don't have time to talk to you no matter how much you would love to connect with me. I would love to get my work done. So thank you, but no thank you. Okay, so get rid of that. I like to connect, I love to connect. No one cares. Also, uh, just in general, and this is number four, I want to, or I love to, I wanted to, I wanted to reach out and see, I love to do this again, back to no one cares what you want. They only care what you can do for them. Okay. Focus on them. Not what you want. It's not about what you want. It's about what they want. The more you realize it's about what they want and not about you, what you want, the more money you'll make. All right. Now, number five. I thought you might be the right person to connect with. Well, I thought you would do more research before you called me or before you emailed me. Okay? Shows just a lack of research. In the world of LinkedIn and data.com and all these different data sites and lists, and there's no excuse. Now, back in my day, when I first started and we were, it was literally, when I picked up the phone and called, I had a name and maybe a title. That's it. There was no other place to find that information. Then maybe it might make more sense. But nowadays, no. That's just a filler. It's a filler and all it is. And everybody says it. So, so get rid of that. Get that out of your vocabulary. You should know 
if they're the right person to reach out to. Now, you might be wrong, and that's okay, but don't say that. It puts you in a bad light. Uh, number six, are you the decision maker? Okay. Are you worth my time as a prospect? Because if you're not, you're, that's basically what you're saying. Okay, so if they're not the decision maker, you're making them feel bad. If they are the decision maker, you're still basically saying, the only reason why I'm talking to you is because you're the decision maker. Now, that's probably true, but don't say that. Uh, now, if you're, say, further along in the process and you're on an intake call and you're taking a search assignment and and uh, you want to make sure all the decision makers are present, right, simply say, well, other than you, so I'm assuming you are, other than you, who else is also involved in the, dis in the decision? And where do you line in relation to each other on the org chart? There you go. Same, basically the same thing, and but you're not putting them in, in that defensive posture. So never say, are you the decision maker, okay? Um, it's like calling a guy and saying, are you the man of the house? Of course I am, right? You don't want to get there. Don't want to go there. All right, number seven. I'd like to see if it might make sense to work together. Now, for anybody that used to work for me years and years ago, that was one of my signature phrases. I like to see if it might make sense to work together. Now, on the surface, it sounds perfectly reasonable. Perfectly reasonable. I like to see if it might make sense to work together. But what you're honestly saying is that, well, I really don't believe in what I do. And I'm trying to be super polite. I know you're busy, but look, I like to see if it might make sense to work together. Right? You're trying to be super professional. But what the client hears, or the prospect hears, is, oh, great, so you want to pitch me? That's what they hear. So just don't say it at all, all right? It's weak sauce. Get that out of your vocabulary. I used to do that all the time. I used to say it all the time, and um, it's not effective, so get rid of it, get rid of it. Okay, number eight, is it a good time to connect? No, it's never a good time to connect if you ask that question. Call and you say, is it a good time to chat? No, it's a bad time. Well, why'd you pick up the phone? Don't say that, all right? Uh, they're automatically going to say no. Oftentimes they will. So I would rather you just not say it at all. But if you have to say something, say that I happen to catch you at a bad time. It's still being very polite. And also recognizing, I get that you're probably busy. Understood. No worries. I get that you're busy. All right? And if they say... Oftentimes, they'll still say no, because the first reaction is to say no. No. Okay, great. Then you can talk. And then, of course, if they say, yes, it is a bad time, simply say, I hear you. No problem at all. Let me tell you why I'm calling. I'll tell you why I'm calling, and then we can see if it might make sense to talk later. There you go. Easy. All right? So, got to catch you at a bad time. All right, number nine is pitch. Now, you might be thinking, like, why would I say pitch to a prospect? So not many of you do this, but I, I've done it myself many times, and I've caught other people doing this. So and I've caught it enough to include it on this list. Oftentimes what we do, we try to be a little bit self-deprecating with our prospects, and we don't try to come off too strong. So when we get on the phone with a prospective client, they've never heard us, or heard of us, don't know anything about us. And so we say, well, Bob, I appreciate you taking the time to speak to me today. And let me just give the little our little pitch before we get into who you are, what you need, or et cetera. And then you give your little 60-second elevator pitch or what have you. Okay, You're telling them right off the bat that you don't believe in what you do. I'm sorry, I have to say this. I have to give the, the, the minute elevator speech, pitch, whatever. I'm sorry. Then we can get to the important stuff, which is about no. So quit saying that. So quit saying pitch. Number 10 is just following up or touching base. Okay. First off, if you're touching base, what are you touching? Okay. Don't say that. Don't say that. Now, it sounds reasonable. Hey, I'm following up. Well, everybody seems to say that, yes, but every salesperson says and what's What you're saying is basically this. Hey, I wasn't able to close, close you over the phone last time we spoke. 
So I'm following up again to see if I can close you this time. Oh, I didn't, okay, great. And then a month later, hey, I'm following up again. Can I close you now? Nope, okay. Next one, I'm following up again. Do you do you like follow-up calls from, from, from people trying to sell you? Just following up, do you have a need yet? Nope. Following up, do you have a need yet? Nope. Right, do, do you like those calls? No. So offer something of value. Quit saying following up, quit saying touching base. Call with a call with a reason. Bob, I heard that X company is laying off. Have you heard this? Wanted to make sure I share this information with you. I just wrote an article that I think would be a great value to boom. It can help you with your interview process. Bam. You know, hey, here's a case study I wanted to share with you that I think really blah blah blah. Whatever it is, but call with something. Call it value. Because what happens is if you're calling just following up and touching base and they get these all day long and you're lumping yourself into what we call leg humpers. You don't want to be a leg humper recruiter, okay? So get that out of your vocabulary. Number 11, and this is similar. I haven't heard back from you. Now, at first glance, this seems like it's okay because it seems reasonable. Hey, Bob, I didn't hear back from you. What's going on? You may send it to a candidate. Hey, I didn't hear back from you. You're supposed to get back to me last week about this. Let me know if you were interested in and being submitted for this position. What happened? Well, what happened was they weren't interested, so they didn't get back to you, or it wasn't important enough to get back to you, or they forgot, or life gets in the way, they got busy. Shit happens. Don't make them feel guilty, don't make them feel bad. So again, call with something of value. Don't make every time you call, hey, you didn't hear from me, or I didn't hear from you. Okay, you know what happens when you get somebody who continually calls you and calls you, hey, I didn't hear from you yet. Hey, can you let me know? Hey, what's going on? And it's a no, you're not interested or just it's not the right time. So what do you do? You ignore and you ignore and you ignore, you ignore. So instead of doing that and, and chase them like a puppy dog, trying to, you know, don't do that. Instead of doing that, just simply say, just tell them that you assume it's a no, but just perfectly fine. Tell them it's okay. Hey, not a problem at all. It's probably a no, you're probably not interested, no worries. Reach back out to me when you're ready, if you're ready, or I'll reach back out to you again here in a few months, we'll see where things stand then. Something like that. But don't reach back out and say, I didn't hear from you. Okay, don't chase. All right, number 12 is fee or service charge or price. Never, ever, ever say those three things. Say investment. You see, service charge, price, fee, all those things, they carry negative connotation. Now granted, investment really means the same thing, but it has a different connotation, okay? It's the investment in our services. So the investment in this service is X. The investment to hire a top performing candidate, which is what I like to use, is Y, okay? It's an investment in the value. The investment for our service, so you can hire a validated top 10% performer is blank. And that is a lot more powerful of a closing statement than our fee is this. Or, what's even worse, our standard fee is this. When you say our standard fee is this, you're basically saying, I'm willing to give you a discount, which by the way is number 13 on the list, discount. Never say discount. Now you might be willing to discount, which is perfectly fine, but don't say discount, okay? It commoditizes your service. Number 14, what if we, you know, Bob, what if we extended the guarantee? What if we what if we dropped our price by X? Would you use our service then? Can we help with the search? Right? It's you're 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 kind of entering into used car salesman territory. So don't do that. What do I gotta do to get you into this car today? Let's get that out of your vocabulary. So what if we drop it? 
Next on the list, that would be number 15, contract. Don't use contract. So, all right, great. Let me send you the contract so you can sign your life away. Better to use agreements. Let's send an agreement because we're going to agree to a mutually beneficial arrangement. Or use what I say, which is paperwork. Great, Bob. We'll get started right away. Let's just knock this paperwork out. I'm going to send you the paperwork, send it back, and we'll just knock it out and get it done. Something along those lines. So I tend to use paperwork. That's the word I like to use. You can use agreement, whatever it is. Just don't say contract. Contract is bad. Okay, number 16. This is a big one. We are better than fill in the blank competitor. Now, I've said this before in my uh, accelerator training with some of my students, and I always get confused looks. I said, wait a minute, David, you talk shit about me in your industry all the time. Yes, I do, but there's a subtle difference between what I do and talking shit about my competitors. And notice, I never talk bad about my competitors. In fact, I've got some competitors um, that are great, actually. Uh, some that are even in the Herc, hashtag, the Herc Facebook group, okay? Now, with that said, most of the competitors in the SAP industry cannot touch me. Now, I'm not going to talk bad about them. Now, I might say there are, bo there are body shop recruiters out there. I'll use that as a blanket term. I'll talk bad about an industry or a practice within the industry. I'll talk bad about contingency and that it really doesn't serve our clients. And here's why I want to educate them so they can make an informed decision. But why I would never talk shit about a competitor, even if they were bad. I would just simply either say, I don't know, or I've heard they're good. Because here's the thing, they're offering a different service. If you've done what you need to do to create a completely different offering than what your other competitors are offering, then it's very easy for you to say, yeah, in fact, I've heard they're great. It's a different service that they're offering. It's completely different. But for what they do, they do a pretty good job. I've heard good things. Or you could say, for what they do, I haven't heard much about them, but I'm sure they're probably good at what they do. But it's different than what we have to offer. Now, if you're a recruiter who has not come up with an offer, who really offers the exact same thing as every other person down the street, because just because you're willing to hustle harder, or just because you're a specialist, doesn't mean you're any better than the other guy. To your clients, it's all, all the same, really. So you got to figure out what you have to offer that is significantly better. And then you can legitimately say, oh, no, they're fine. They're just a different, they offer something different. If that's what you're looking for, I would go with them. Okay? But never talk about your best competitor. It puts you in a bad light. It's very petty. Don't do it. All right, so number 17, innovative and cutting edge. Okay, first, if you say your product is innovative, then your product is not actually innovative. If your product, or if you call your product cutting edge, then your product is probably not actually cutting edge. So get rid of those descriptors. Um, in addition, and this course is number 18, um, if you have these on your LinkedIn profile, get rid of them. Okay, visionary, authentic, thought leader, influencer, okay? I joke about this all the time. If you say you're a thought leader, then you, sir, are not, in fact, a thought leader. Because real thought leaders don't call themselves thought leaders. Real influencers don't have the word influencer in their LinkedIn title. Now, the, the old joke is that we used to have back in the day is if you call yourself a ladies man, then you, sir, are not, in fact, a ladies man. Same principle applies. If you are one, you don't need to call yourself one. The only people who call themselves one are ones who want to be one but haven't gotten there yet. So don't put that on your LinkedIn profile or call yourself that. And number 19, we are almost there, and that is technobabble. Now, not that you say technobabble, the word itself, but technobabble speak, gobbledygook, whether that be corporate speak or too many buzzwords or too much industry vernacular where you're just trying to show off and, and speak word salad to people, okay? Now, it's good to still speak in some technical language to demonstrate your, your knowledge of the industry, but at the end of the day, you want to talk in fairly simplistic terms 
but cut into the pain and the problems they're experiencing and then draw out some of the consequences they may experience if they don't take action to find out what their real problem is, right? And how they're trying to solve it, which is not which is not the right way to solve it because that's why they still have the problem. And then educate them about the, the real solution, how they really can solve it. And through that, you would demonstrate your authority. That, that's kind of how, how you get them to take action, not by just vomiting word salad. So get techno babble out of the way because it does get in the way of the sale, whatever that sale is. And number 20, trusted advisor. I hear this all the time. My clients want a trusted advisor. I am a trusted advisor to my clients. No one gives a shit about you being a trusted advisor. I have financial reps reach out to me um, you know, for, you know, say investment or they want to talk you know, about my retirement plan, whatever it is. And they all say the same thing. Every single one says they are a trusted advisor. And, I, and, and my thought always is this. I don't give a shit about getting a trusted advisor. I want to make more money. I want to protect my investments. I want to make sure I retire comfortably. Whatever it is, I want that thing that to get there, sure, I need a trusted advisor, but on its own, I don't need a trusted advisor. So talk more about the pain that your clients are in or candidates and about the solutions you can provide and about the, the, the help you can give them to help them achieve their vision. And by through that, you become a trusted advisor but don't say you're a trusted advisor it's like calling yourself a thought leader right same principle so don't call yourself a trusted advisor and that is the 20 words and phrases but i have one extra it is a bonus round word that i hate and now this is more of a personal dislike for the word and that is the word bespoke hate the word bespoke now bespoke has come into fashion as of late uh and i can't stand it it's used uh to describe a solution that is customized for a a client or a prospect or what have you okay look bespoke simply means and by the way people think it means a tailored suit it does not Natural bespoke suit actually means when they take the bolt of cloth and they cut a suit specifically for one person. So a tailored suit is just a suit that's been slightly modified to fit a particular body style or a particular person. But a bespoke suit was when somebody back in the olden times would go and, and see the bolt of cloth and say, I speak for that bolt of cloth. And they would go cut them a suit out of that specifically made for them. That was a bespoke suit. Now. If you wear a monocle and a top hat and you wax your mustache and you go to the barber for a straight razor shave, okay, I can see you using the word bespoke. But if you're describing your solution to a client, you say it's a bespoke solution, use the word customized. It's just fancy word salad, doesn't mean anything. Look, you can go to a, taco, a street taco shop and order customized tacos doesn't mean they're bespoke tacos okay any more than the other customized tacos i could buy down the road and by the way if you're ever in tampa florida go to the taco bus they're the best street tacos you will ever have at least the best in this city so with that said those are the 21 or actually 20 yeah the 21 words and phrases that you should never ever ever use because they will kill your sales and let me know in the comments below are there are any others that i missed there probably are let me know in the comments what you think are sales killers and why you think that is the case and until next time peace